thought about a lot of stuff that I didn't know about, uh, especially about erections. So that's very interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, so we have the task of covering systemic therapy for castration resistant prostate cancer, and there has happened a lot, as you know. Um, we are three of us, and we have decided to divide the topic. The background, that's me, so all the data, a lot of Kaplan-Meier curves for everyone um, with the phase three data. Then Peter Hammer is talking about what should we do now with all this data, how should we treat our patients, and Richard is giving you a look in the future. And someone from the audience said it yesterday, I think especially in that group of patients, castration resistant, where there is no cure, also with all the new substances we show you, there's no cure yet. The most important thing is improvement of quality of life. And that is by palliation of symptoms by our therapies, and that we try to have therapies with not a lot of side effects. But another point anyway for a lot of patients is prolongation of lifetime. And also since that's the point that all the agencies are looking for, that's the end point of all our trials. So I only speak about phase three trials. I don't speak about the old hormonal substances. Then if we are really honest, at least me, I don't know any really valuable phase three da data about bicalutamide, for example, in that setting. Um, I speak a little bit about the first line chemotherapy, even that's not so new. And the other ones are Carpacitaxel, you've heard about that, that's the Tropic study, another chemotherapy um, that's been given after docetaxel. Then albiroteron, you heard that, so there's positive data after docetaxel, but now, a w exactly a week ago, um, it's unblinded also for pre-chemotherapy setting. MDV, you've heard about that, that's not published yet, but I show you some slides um, stolen from EAU. And I say some words about Cipolucel, even if it's not approved um, in Switzerland and not in Europe, but only by the FDA. And radium has been talked to you about uh, from Dr. Miller, I think. So <laughs> chemotherapy. Anyway, just that's still our standard of care for patients who are symptomatic and have castration-resistant prostate cancer. That's probably going to change soon with this new unblinded data with albiroteron, but they were mostly patients with only minimal met uh, symptoms. So we have to see what the patients are. And as you see here, these are the overall survival data. We speak always about three months, and it's only true for the docetaxel free weekly arm. So you have a median overall survival benefit of about three months that has been updated. You have side effects, clearly. This is the chemotherapy, you know, myelosuppression, mucositis, hypersensitivity reactions. But we have to say that generally is really a pretty well-tolerated therapy. And I think that's very counterintuitive, and that's what I always have to tell also our urologists. The quality of life in that study showed clearly that in both those ataxial arms, the quality of life was significantly better than in the mitoxantron prednisone arm. And you can argue, yes, but that's also chemotherapy. But Tanok has shown, like 1996 already, that mitoxantron prednisone is significantly better in pain responses <coughs> than prednisone alone. So you have not only a placebo arm, you have an active arm here, and still with the docetaxel, you see a significant improvement in quality of life. And that's counterintuitive, I know that, but it is true, and we both see the patients that come to us and say, we, we are much happier if we have the chemotherapy. So after three weeks, they come back and they say, oh, happy, I'm happy I get the chemotherapy again because my pain gets worse in the last two days. So, I mean, I think that's something you have to keep in mind. The second chemotherapy, Carpacitaxel, it's also a taxane. It's also working in patients and in cell lines that are refractory to docetaxel. 
It was a big phase three trial, 755 patients. And important is, it was not against placebo. It's the only trial that's not against placebo. It was against mitoxantron and prednisone again. That's, you should keep in mind. I think that's a big difference in the two studies I show you now. And the patients were mostly in a good performance status. That's important. They all had had docetaxel. Most had had some, some others had, um, had more therapies, 30% of the patients. And again, also this chemotherapy obviously has side effects. The ones we know, hematotoxicity. In the trial, there were seven patients who died in febrile neutropenia in the arm with carpocytaxel versus one in the mitoxantron arm. That is something that probably shouldn't happen that often. If you only look at the patients who were treated in the US and in Europe, that was only one patient. So that's the same than in the mitoxantron arm. Most patients who died from febrile neutropenia were in Mexico and in India. So we, we have to think if it's also like a selection of who's treating the patient and how experienced they are with, with giving chemotherapy. And diarrhea is a problem as well. And here again, you see it's always like the same number. So the overall survival is better about three months again. But here, and again, you have to know it is against mitoxantron that has shown some overall, uh, some palliation benefit. It's not better than mitoxantron in palliation. But it's an active drug. Now I come to the hormonal agents. So it's Abiration and the MDV 3100 because they have phase three data already published. You've all seen that slide, I guess. That's the abiratron, how it works. It's a CYP17 inhibitor. That's enzymes that work here, and they just inhibit the um, androgen biosynthesis. From this schedule, you also see what side effects we see. It's mineralocortico <coughs> excess. So this is the 301 trial, so the abiratron trial that was done in patients who have had chemotherapy, all of them with docetaxel. It was also a big phase three trial. It was against placebo prednisone in a two to one um, randomization, over 1,000 patients. It had recruited very, very well. And you see the patient's characteristics. That's really the patients we see, like the oldest one was 95. So you can give this drug to elderly patients. They were mostly in a good performance status, but that was also one of the inclusion criteria, so that's easy. And all of them had had one light of, of uh, docetaxel. That's the side effects. I think that's only the relevance that I picked, the relevant side effects I picked out. So that's really what the drug is doing. Fluid retention and edema, you have to look for that. Hypokalemia, you really have to monitor potassium if you treat these patients because they also do arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, if they go down with the potassium. They have a little bit more cardiac disorders. They have liver function abnormalities and they develop hypertension, some of them. So it's not a big difference to the placebo group because also in the placebo group was prednisone and prednisone can do also some of these side effects. But that's that's really the side effects you have to look for if you treat patients with albiratron. Overall survival in the updated um, at ECHO, the data, four months. So you have a benefit of four months in the patients with albiratron. And you see here, and that's another index than the tropic trial used, so you can't compare it, but you see a big difference in the pain intensity palliation in favor of albiratron. So this is working in quality of life and in overall survival. Again, against placebo. MDV, this is from EAU. Um, I just photographed it, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a very good slide. Um, it's not published yet, so we don't know all the details about that trial. But it was in the same indication, this trial, um, after docetaxel. It has been unblinded early because it was an overall survival benefit. As you know, the MDV is also an oral component like albiratron, so that's easy. You can swallow a tablet. You don't have to be IV infusions like with the chemotherapy. 
It's a novel androgen receptor inhibitor, and it doesn't have pro-androgen receptor um, properties as we know now. And that's the overall survival. So again, you see, like in all the trials, like about four months. So it, like, you, you see that in every trial is about three to four months overall survival that you gain and all that I show you. That was also against placebo. Some words about the C. cell that's only really given in America. So there was like 20% patients who have been treated with chemotherapy in that trial. So that were mostly patients who hadn't had chemotherapy, were asymptomatic patients. That's a total different patient population from the other two trials we've seen. Much better ECOG performance status, low Gleason grades. So these are really the good patients. The Cipolusa T or Provenge, I guess some of the patients come to you and ask about that. Um, it's actually an active immunotherapy. You take away the white blood cells from the patient and then you activate it with PAP, that's the prostate cancer antigen, and the GMCSF and give the, all the cells back to the patient. And it was three times IV in the distance of two weeks. It was also a phase three trial that was placebo controlled again, 500 patients. The side effects of, of that therapy are very, very mild. We know that from all other vaccinations, injection side reactions, some chills, some headaches, like influenza-like symptoms, nothing else we've seen as side effects. And again, you see the magic four months of overall survival. No effect on progression-free survival, no effect on PSA response. Nobody could really explain that overall survival benefit. And there is a big discussion going on right now. If not, that placebo arm could have been detrimental to the patients. Because what they did is also taking the leukapheresis, so taking a lot of white blood cells out that are very important for your immune system, and just giving a third of them back, non-activated. So there could be some kind of immune depletion that makes the, the placebo arm worse than the superlucida arm. So this is something that's now in big discussion. Also the subgroup of the patients that are above 65 were the ones where the big difference was. And that could be because the elderly patients were more susceptible to not having their immune cells. So these, all these results have a big question mark, and I guess um, we discussed it, but it's not approved in Europe. And uh, I had at least one patient who really wanted to do that, like going to Dr. Google, who has sent it, and found that on the Google. And uh, I tried to find out how much it costs if you really go and do it. It's not only that we talked about it, the $93,000 that the vaccinations cost, it's $250 as a package, because you have to go there and get the infusions. And we haven't talked about the flight and everything. So that's an expensive therapy. It's easy, it's only three times an infusion, four weeks, you're done, but it's not clear if the results are so um, clear to us, and it's very expensive. So as a summary, we have much more new treatments than in the last 20 years before for castration-resistant prostate cancer that have shown an overall survival bit in phase three, Capacitaxel, abiraturon, Superlucil T only in America, radium, MDV 3100, now the abiraturon also before <coughs> chemotherapy. And my take home message before I go to Dr. Humber, who has to tell us now what we do with all the substances, um, we should try to make best use of them. And also abiraturon, I mean, we have treated now like 30 or 40 patients. That's not a wonder drug. There's some patients who respond very, very well, some patients who don't respond at all, and most of the patients respond for some time, but then progress again. So I guess we, we have also, you know, to, to think about who are the patients who do profit. We need to find predictive markers. So not everyone gets all the toxicity from the treatments. Um, 
but it doesn't get any effect. And we have the SOC trials, so um, please contact George or me if you want to participate in one of them. I guess that's all. So we move on to the next presentation and we'll discuss the presentations all together at the end. So, dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, it's really a great honor to be covered by two great oncologists. You know, I feel like a sandwich and, well, my part is to tell you what we really should do now, how to treat a patient. And this is a typical patient right. from Braunschweig, he's 73 years old. He had a bad cancer, Gleason 4 plus 4, and he had radiotherapy and hormonal treatment. And it worked well, PSA came down, but you know, not really very down, and then he was progressing. You know, his PSA, February 2010, went up to 31. And what should we do? You know, I'm just a urologist, a uro-oncologist, and I like guidelines. And this is the latest NCCN guideline. It's still warm. It came up um, a few weeks ago. And I would like, you know, based on these NCCN guidelines, how we would treat this man. Well, first, if, well, he has castration-resistant prostate cancer, and if he is negative for metastasis, it's always important to check his testosterone level. So that's the first what we would do, check his testosterone level. And then, you know, if he has no meds, there are certain options. Unfortunately, he had meds. We did a PET scan, and he had a few um, bone meds here and there. So he has bone meds, studies positive for metastasis, and George already mentioned this. But this is only in castration-resistant prostate cancer. We do not give denosumab or solidronic acid in men with hormone-naive cancer. We can discuss this. But all the data we have, all great trials, are in men with castration-resistant prostate cancer. So there are two good options. And you have seen this trial from The Lancet comparing denosumab and solidronic acid in men with castration-resistant prostate cancer, rising PSA, and bone mats. And these were the results. And denosumab was a little bit better compared to the good solidronic acid. What do you do if the man is symptomatic? And again, this is standard treatment. And Silke, I think, showed very nicely that treatment with doxetaxel is really the standard since many, many years. And it's a treatment which is well tolerated, but of course has some side effects. And what else is important? Clinical trial. If we do not have clinical trials, there will be no advance in any form of medicine. And all the new drugs like abiraterone or zoledronic acid, denosumab, came out because we had trials. So which trial do we have in a situation like this for our patient? Well, regarding MDV, you know, there are always two studies. One in chemo-naive patients, like this man, and of course there's always a study post-chemo. So the prevailed study, it's a phase three trial, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and we are one of the study centers. And this would be one option. You know, the Affirm study was unblinded in January this year. There's another substance, the TAC-700. And also, this is an ongoing trial, chemo-naive, phase 3, 1,400 patients. And this would be the other options. And I think you should discuss with the patient if he should be interested in becoming part of this trial. And, you know, the Kuga trial, this has finished the 302 trial, and it was unblinded by the DSMB one week ago. So we will see the results, I think, in a few months, and then it will be registered in the US and in Europe as well. But 
When I see patients and I talk to them about trials, I think it's important that they understand what a trial means. Because these trials are usually placebo-controlled trials. And when you tell them, well, there is a trial, this is a new substance, we don't know if it works, but it's promising. But you have also the chance that you don't get anything. Then, you know, it's a sort of problem. And these are questions I suggest that every patient should ask his doctor to go through it. Well, first, is there a clinical trial? What is the purpose of the study? What kinds of tests and treatments does the study involve? What does the treatment really do to me? Has the treatment been used before? Has it been used for other types of cancers? Is there any experience? Will I know which treatment I receive? And usually the answer is no. What is likely to happen to me with or without this new treatment? What are my other choices? Do I have other choices? And what are the benefits and risks? And how might the study change my daily life? I think this is also important. This is just an oral drug. You take minimal side effects and you have to come into the center maybe every four weeks. I think this is reasonable. Or is it a study where you have to stay in the hospital and you, know, you spend many of your time in the hospital? What side effects can I expect from the study? And how can the side effects be controlled? And will I have to stay in the hospital? Will the study cost me anything? If I'm harmed as a result of the research, what treatment might I get? And what type of long-term follow-up care is part of the study? I think these are all important questions, and you should discuss all these questions with your patient. I did this, and the man said, oh no, I go for doxotaxel. Okay, his choice. And it worked fine, but then he was progressing. And bone scan and PSA was rising, and this was his PSA in October 9, um, 2011. And bone scan doesn't look really good. So he's progressing after chemotherapy with doxotaxel. And then there's the question, what do we do right now? What are his options? And again, I like the NCCN guidelines. And for second-line treatment, we have a few options. Abiraterone is registered and cabacitaxel. And again, clinical trial. So what do we have in this situation? Well, abiraterone, you give 1,000 milligrams. It's a pill with 250 milligrams. So the patient has to take four pills, and it's in combination with prednisone. And it's really a reasonable treatment option, and you saw the results from Silker. And it's, this treatment is well tolerated, but again, it's not a magic drug. Some patients really benefit, and you, we have seen major improvement, but we have other patients, and we didn't see anything. You have to monitor hypertension, hypokalemia, peripheral edema, liver function, and fatigue. And that's the other option. Carbacetaxel, it's a chemotherapy. You give it every three weeks. And you should check for adequate liver and kidney and bone marrow function. And you want not to include patients with severe neuropathy. And if necessary, you may consider prophylactic um, granulocyte growth factor injection. And what study do we have? We have the TAC study in a situation like this. This is the only open study in Germany. Um, post chemotherapy, the C21005 randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. So I would suggest that he will go into this trial or choose the other two options. That's it. He doesn't have any other option except best supportive care. If he says, I don't want any treatment at all, I just don't want any pain, that's an option. 
So you give him best supportive care. And I believe it's very important in a situation like this that we check quality of life. And there are many non-controlled, non-randomized, non-interventional studies in Germany, in Switzerland, and in the rest of Europe. And this is just an example. The quality time study, and they are looking at general information of the global health status and looking at QLQC30 and overall survival. And this was a combined study of the German medical oncology group and the German uro-oncology group, and I was part of the study team. And I think it's important when you see patients in a, situa in a situation like this that you evaluate quality of life. This is already my last slide. I think we should do, or we have to do, an interdisciplinary treatment planning. And all these patients are discussed in our two more board. And we have to keep in mind it's a palliative situation. We do not cure any of these men with castration-resistant prostate cancer. And the treatment decision should be <coughs> individualized based on comorbidity and the functional status of the patient. And what I really believe that quality of life measurements in a situation like this are absolutely important. Thank you very much. So, as I said, we take the questions at the end of the session, and now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Richard Katomas. Uh, he's medical oncologist in Kuhl, which is actually, for those uh, who don't know it, the capital city of this region. And uh, he's the guy I'm referring my patients to with advanced prostate cancer. So, please, uh, Richard, tell us about the new compounds and what we can expect. Okay, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Well, actually, there has not only been an inflation in, in drugs that we use nowadays in prostate cancer, there also is an inflation in speakers that talk about it. So when I was invited two years ago, I was the only one talking about it for 15 minutes. Now today we have 60 minutes and we are three speakers. So that's a big advantage already. Um, and you have heard a lot of what we have already that we can use um, in these patients who so far had hardly any options at all. And um, I try to give you an insight into the future, what's going to come, but I'm also telling you what is not going to come because there have been quite a few negative trials as well, and it's important to know about them too. So you will see a multitude of agents and trials, and maybe, I hope I, it's, not, it's not too boring, so I, I try to keep it fairly short. This is um, a table taken from a very nice review uh, written by Cora Sternberg and, her, uh, and two colleagues that was just published a few months ago in the European Neurology. And you can see that there are so many different pathways that can be targeted. Um, it was about new molecular targets in prostate cancer. You can see the androgen signaling pathway. We know about the CYP17 inhibitors. It's the abiraterone, the TEC700. There may be more to come. Um, survival pathways are very important. This is where the usual chemotherapy kicks in. But we have mTOR inhibitors. Um, we have a clustering antisense uh, molecules that I will talk to you about. There are the new uh, um, chemotherapy drugs. So this certainly is an important pathway as well. The angiogenic pathway, so anti-angiogenic drugs, um, have been tested, many of them. I will show you the results. They are not as uh, well as we hoped they would be. But still, it's believed that this is a pathway that we have to look into. Um, invasion and metastasis of tumor cells is a very important point. If we could prevent or the, the, the invasion and the metastasizing of the tumor, certainly a lot would be done. And I will show you a few data about the MET inhibitor that have just uh, been presented last year at the ESCO meeting, which is very interesting. And then, last but not least, the immune mechanisms, apart from Cipollucel T that you've seen, there will be fair number of new compounds, and this will be antibodies against CTLA-4 and PD-1 that are much easier to give, that have been proven in a melanoma, and these trials are going on, and I will show you, show you a little bit about that. Now, just to, to try to show you how quick the field changes, this is 
um, a, a figure from the editorial that came with the Abiraterone trial in the New England Journal in April 2011, so it's hardly a year ago, and they tried to show what is going on in, in prostate cancer, and now 10 months later, um, I can still show you what, what we have, what we always have known. It's the docetaxel, it's the cavacetaxel, it's the abiraterone. It's all um, approved, it's registered, it's used in Switzerland, Germany. Um, the cipolusal T, we've heard about the impact. Um, I doubt whether this will really be introduced in Europe at all. But then, um, from all the other phase three uh, trial um, results, Something is not even on the map here, and this is alpha radin, which you had a separate talk yesterday, and nobody was really aware of this phase three trial, apparently, not even um, people who are very experienced in, in treatment of systemic prostate cancer, and that came out two months after this editorial. And then there have been a few negative trials already. The lenalidomide phase three trial turned out to be negative. The cibotentin trial turned out to be negative and the atrazentin trial turned out to be negative. So only 10 months later, we would draw a completely different picture from this figure. Um, so going back to phase three trials, you have seen the five positive ones, but how many of the phase three trials have also been negative? And I will briefly go through it with you. And it's, most of the trials were actually combinations with docetaxel. And apparently docetaxel is not a, a very easy partner, and Ian Tenock, when he discussed one of the trials a year ago, felt that um, combining a drug with docetaxel is like being married to Liz Taylor. It's a very difficult um, situation, apparently. So you have the DN101, which is a high-dose vitamin D, and not only was this arm with the DN101 um, a negative, it was even worse. So if you give high-dose vitamin D with, with docetaxel, you get a worse result, and people lived less long than with docetaxel alone, so you shouldn't do that. Um, then the bevacizumab, it's called a Vestin. We use it in different cancers. It's an anti-angiogenic antibody. It's easy to use, but again, it was negative, so this will not be used in the future. Lenalidomide is a very easy-to-use drug. It's an oral drug. Again, it's an anti-angiogenic drug but it also has some um, anti-immune, well, immune mechanisms that are difficult to, to know. And there was a very interesting phase two trial showing, a, a, in a randomized phase two, showing a benefit of survival of, I think, five months or even more than that, but now the trial is negative. So we have to be very careful going from phase two into phase three. Etrazentin is an endothelin A antagonist, what was combined with docetaxel. Again, it's an anti-angiogenic treatment, doesn't work, was negative. And then in, uh, in second-line treatment, sunitinib, you know from the treatment of um, renal cell carcinoma, the multi-target tyrosine inhibitor. Again, it's an anti-angiogenic treatment. Second line, after docetaxel, compared to placebo, no difference. So again, anti-angiogenic treatment that didn't work, and last, is another endothelin A antagonist. This was versus best supportive care. Um, didn't work either. So not every drug that is tested um, does work. However, there are many more drugs to come, unfortunately, and within two years we will probably have to prolong the session again. So because uh, quite, quite a few um, results are um, awaited. First of all, it's two more antiangiogenic drugs. One is uh, desquinimod which I haven't used, um, which does anti-angiogenic and immune modulation properties, and it will, be check, um, it will be tested versus placebo in patients who are asymptomatic and have not had uh, docetaxel. The aflibercept is an anti-angiogenic drug which we have used in other cancers. I wonder if you have seen that like four or five anti-angiogenic drugs haven't worked, whether these two drugs really will work, and I very much doubt that. The androgen pathway, I don't want to go into that, but every drug that you've heard of before, abiraterone, AMDV 3100, and TEC 700, will be tested in the pre docetaxel setting, and it is very likely that they will be just as effective as in the post docetaxel But all of these trials will have the placebo arm that will never have received abiraterone or anything else. So what you're actually doing is comparing an abiraterone arm versus a non-abiraterone arm. And we know that that is, that is better. We just don't know when exactly to use it, before or after, with the docetaxel. 
so there are quite a few questions remaining. Um, I briefly told you about the um, kind of vaccine trials with the antibodies. I don't want to go into that, but there is also, apart from Cipolusal T, another vaccine, Prostvac, that showed uh, interesting results. Mm. Then it's the invasion and metastasis pathway, the dazetinib. It's a drug that is used in CML at the moment. Um, it's a SARC a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and CKIT inhibitor. Um, that is a phase three ongoing with docetaxel against docetaxel alone. And I want to show you the data of cabozantinib, which is a CMET inhibitor, <coughs> and there are survival pathways. <coughs> so you can really see from, from these two, and I try to keep it short, um, from, from these two slides that it's a lot going on and it's really difficult to, to keep up with all that is doing. So only two drugs I want to present in the sake of time so that you can go skiing soon. So it's cabozantinib. Why will I show you that? Because it's first of all a, a new kind of, of treatment which has so far not been used. It was presented last year at ESCOS. It was a phase two trial. It's a multi-target tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So think about sunitinib and then you will have similar side effects as well with these drugs. It is working on the um, mesenchymal epithelial transition factor receptor pathway. So it's just kind of another pathway that is important in, uh, in, in the tumor cells. And by blocking this pathway, you will um, downregulate proliferation, you will improve apoptosis. Uh, it's also working on angiogenesis and you can see all, all that it is supposed to do. What is interesting is, and this is why maybe in prostate cancer, this could be a more interesting drug than in other cancers, that patients with bone metastasis, it has been shown that it's associated with very high MET levels. So therefore, blocking this MET pathway could be an interesting way forward. And also, it's been shown in animal models that if you have castrated animals, again, you have a CMET upregulation. And that this is how this pathway works. It's maybe a bit too boring, but this would be the ligand, the hepatocyte growth factor. It binds here um, to the CMET receptor, and all you do is, is blocking these downstream cascades, which in the end then leads to, to all these effects of apoptosis and antiproliferation. So these were 170 patients in this phase two trial. It's an oral drug, but be aware, this is not abiraterone. This is a drug with side effects. People will experience fatigue. If they lose their appetite. They will have diarrhea. They will have hand foot syndrome. And you can see here, half of the patients had a dose reduction for adverse events. So this is a toxic drug. And 10% even discontinued it in, in a phase two trial. But it works very well, and especially if you look at the results for the bone scan, after 12 weeks, 76% had either a complete or partial resolution in the bone scan, and two thirds of the patients had improved pain, which is unseen before. And, and uh, I will show you these pictures, maybe you have seen them before, of um, bone scans um, before and 12 weeks after starting this treatment. And, and you can easily see, you don't need to be a nuclear medicine doctor. <laughs> so this is in a patient who never had docetaxel. It virtually just disappears 12 weeks later. This again is docetaxel pre-treated. This is a, no, sorry, this is a pre-treated. This is a docetaxel naive patient. It works very well. The question is, is it just down regulation of the um, <laughs> activity? So, I mean, these metastases have not disappeared. They just only show, don't show up anymore. So there is a lot of research going on in, in this where, where they, when they will do um, um, biopsies, bone biopsies before and after the drug to really know what's going on in these patients. But they have pain response, they have excellent responses in the bone scan and the phase three is on the way, as you can imagine. Second drug I want to show you is for me more difficult to explain, but because it's a, it's a very strange mechanism that it works through. It's a, it's a um, oligosense uh, nucleotide, so you have to attack the mRNA level, which is, which is difficult. You have to give infusions, and it's a, against the clustering, and the clustering is a chaperone. So a chaperone in, in German, it's kind of a... And then, so, so, and, um, <laughs> Uh, someone who looks after your children. So it's, it's really um, a, 
mechanism in the cell that appears very important. So this clustering um, goes, goes everywhere and it's really like a protector for very different pathways. And it has been shown by um, people from Vancouver that if you block this pathway, that maybe um, you will improve the response to chemotherapy, but also to radiotherapy and to anti-hormonal treatment. So it appears to be a very, very interesting um, pathway blocker. And this was a JCO publication two years ago with 80 patients, and they showed an improvement of six months in overall survival with not a lot of additional adverse events. So again, a phase three is coming here, and it may be that this is another drug that, that is coming in. So to finish, um, I think it's important not to jump from a drug that has once shown an effect in a phase two trial to say, well, this is going to be a positive drug. I'm going to use it already. You have to wait for the phase three results. And before that, I think it's, it's not right to use these drugs outside of clinical trials. There are many new treatment options to come. There is a lot we don't know. We now have these five drugs, you've seen that, but we don't really know what is the optimal sequence. Should we use them in combination? If so, which combination? So there is a lot of research that is needed. And most important even, I think, we don't have predictive biomarkers. You've seen not every patient responds to the treatment, and we don't know who will be the one who really responds to the treatment I offer him. And there must be, like in other cancers in the recent years, we have found subgroups where we know this patient has a high likelihood to respond to our treatment. And similar, um, I think a similar uh, evolution will be going on in prostate cancer. And in two to three years' time, we will know much more. Thank you very much. Okay, so <clears throat> now we have some time for um, questions. Uh, I have one. Um, suppose Medivation, Abiraterone, and TAC are all approved. I'm a urologist. I'm going to want to try another hormone therapy because it's a pill. What are the pros and cons of those three as you understand them right now? Ooh. Well, I have never used the Medivation drug, but um, I, I think it is important to note when do I really use the drug. I mean, if a patient comes in, he has a PSA of, say, 12, and it's rising up to 20, but he's completely asymptomatic. He has a single bone metastasis, or maybe two, but mm -hmm. he's pain-free. Um, probably, I'm not going to, to give him one of these wonder drugs, but I'd probably rather wait. Um, maybe I might still use the B-colutamide. I will probably try to treat him within a trial and, and kind of gain time because the, as long as he is well, as long as he has no high tumor burden, I really wonder whether he has any benefit of these drugs. Yeah, because but, but, at some point, he will need yeah, them. Yeah. And so, if you so use them too early, it may be right. detrimental. When that point comes, how do I decide Which between one those three? <laughs> I think you will use one. Well, TAC 700 and abiraterone is virtually the same. So you use one of the two. And probably you will use the one you're more familiar with. Hmm. Whereas MDV3100 is a completely different mechanism. And I would argue that you can use one after the other. But hmm. so far, we have no data. Do, do they all require prednisone? Um, the MDV doesn't require prednisone, as far as I know. But for the abiretron you need, and for the TEC700 in the dose that it will be registered, you will also need. But maybe well, Peter can... Well, we're working also with, with TAC 700, and the <coughs> theoretical benefit, you don't need any prednisone. And the trial, and this was a long discussion, discussion with, with Maha Hussein, they're using prednisone, you know, just for some safety reason. But um, to be honest, and there are many phase two trials, uh, you don't need prednisone for TAC. But, I mean, Johan de Bono also said probably you don't use it for a birat really need it for everyone for a biratron. So I think they're also going the direction that they perhaps go l a little bit lower with the dose and then just skip the prednisone. I think Which is correct, but you need to be careful. You will, be, you yeah. will have many more hyperkalemia. You will yeah. have more problems with so, so my preference will be driven by the drug representatives? <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope not. I mean... Hopefully, we will have the trials showing which sequence is best, and this is what, need, what needs to happen. But you're right, it may not happen. 
And I think it will be very, very difficult to make these trials because for some I spoke to Johan de Bono exactly about that. I mean, we should now do the sequencing trials, right? So um, which one you should start first because there's some data at least that perhaps the patients with MDV3 1100 who had aburatron, um, I mean not in the trial because they were not included in the trial, but probably don't respond that well. Mm. So I guess um, now it's these problems coming as well. So if you have had one of the drugs, so perhaps the other one is not working so well anymore. So we need the sequencing trials, but I guess it will be very, very yeah. difficult to do them. And because the overall survival is going to be so long and everyone is going to probably get everything, at least in Switzerland, just in the other sequence. So I think hmm. that will be really huge trials you have to do. Well, when you look at improvement in overall survival, this was very similar in all the uh, trials. All these trials were tested against placebo because there was no standard of care. Uh, now we have a new standard, so all new drugs coming up have to be tested against you know, one of these substances, and this will be really interesting. Uh, maybe I want, want to come back with the pro and cons of these new compounds. Uh, let's uh, put the question to, to Silke and Richard. Uh, do you feel that albiratolone and those drugs are safe enough to give them in the hands of the urologists? <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, I assume they were, right? It's, it's our drug, it's our territory. I mean, I think it depends on what is your main issue as a urologist in your clinic. I guess you are probably like, um, really well occupied with making a lot of prostatectomies with your Da Vinci, and you don't have time to measure potassium and uh, look at the, pa at the edema of the patient, I, or do you don't want to have to take, I mean, I think that's really, if you're doing probably mainly treating patients with crustacean resistant prostate cancer as a urologist, perhaps there are some people in here, um, I think that would make sense. I think it's not a, a question if you are a urologist or an oncologist, but more like which kind of patients you normally treat. And I guess the collaboration as it works in, in your clinic and in my clinic that like the urologist more doing the operative things and we do more the, the medical things that works for us. And I guess in some other clinics um, it, it's different like in, in Germany and in Austria where the urologists do also the, the chemotherapies. Um, but I guess you have to have experience and that's what counts because you realize if also if oncologists who don't have experience with aburatron give the aburatron, it doesn't work. We've seen these patients. Right. So it was the same, same discussion, discussion like with the tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mr. Strebel, you, you find an argument to work in a team. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, we've got a great team, so it's, yes. it's quite easy. He important. does. He yes. really does. <laughs> I, yeah, I think, I mean, in, in, in Switzerland, well, what you shouldn't forget is that, I mean, giving out aviretron is easy. To give those a taxel, you need maybe a bit more time. I, I, well, I mean, of course you can learn it, but we, we treat chemotherapy patients every day, but to treat a patient with metastasis is often more than just give him a drug. So it's about mm -hmm. psycho-oncological issues, it's about social issues, mm -hmm. it's about looking after his, his, his wife and, and so on. It's a, it's a lot more than, than just a drug. I think handling the drug would be possible. You just need to see him like we do every two weeks for the first eight to 12 weeks and he will be fine. And as long as he responds, you're absolutely well. But they, after four to six months, they don't respond anymore. So you have to go to the next drug. And, and the, maybe the patient may benefit from a trial. And in most institutions in Switzerland, not in all, like Bern is different and others are different, many of the trials for advanced cancers are with the oncologist. So mm -hmm. I think in Switzerland at least that, that may be an, an issue. It's, it's different from country to country and even from canton to canton. I mean, we have a very good relationship and I think everybody benefits from that. Mm -hmm. did, did you have some case uh, presentations to illustrate the dilemmas or? Perhaps we should ask the audience if they want to go skiing or we case. <laughs> Yes, yeah, okay, I mean, we, we, ha we have prepared I one have because one. that was in our program. So, but um, we are open. Franz. Ski. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. 
Uh oh. This <laughs> requires. The answer is, is also an answer. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. I think it's uh, quarter to two. We can. Who wants to have this case? Rises a hand. Uh, okay. <laughs> Don't even ask the other. Okay.